Hi, we're here today with Jack's keynoter, Kevin Henley. Kevin, could you introduce yourself to our readers? Yeah, sure. Um, Let's see, Kevin Henney, I uh, work for myself. I'm an independent trainer and consultant. I'm based in the UK. Uh, I have a very long standing interest in software development. Um, it's uh, the programming practice all the way through to the process, software architecture, uh, patterns, and so on. And that's actually influenced my, um, I guess, my thinking ultimately. That was the thing that it was, uh, first of all, Software development was a necessity. I can do it. I've just left university. What am I going to do? I can do this. Okay, so I did it. And then I started finding things like object orientation, which were very, very new at the time. And that led me down a particular road and has, has you know, sort of fostered my interests. Um, but I'm also interested in how people do things. Programming practice, um, techniques, test driven development, um, you know, everything from code reviews to uh, practices that are stable, unstable, um, cause people pain, cause people joy, all this kind of stuff. So that's kind of informed what I've done, um, articles I've written, books I've come authored, and so on. Obviously, well, one thing that you kind of are known for talking about is uh, the worst is better principle, which was actually the theme of your keynote today. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a few a little bit more detail about what you spoke about? Yeah, um, worse is better is certainly not a is not a, an idea that I. Um, came up with, it actually follows that history that I've just described. It was uh, articulated by Dick Gabriel, uh, I think probably first in the Journal of Object Oriented Programming around 1990, where I came across it. I, I came across this idea, very interesting, very provocative, um, and it is an idea that has kind of uh, sort of was batted around a bit in the 90s, and people kind of forgotten it. And I thought recently when I went back to science a couple of years ago, I thought, let's revisit it, let's reread what he actually wrote. Now, doing that is interesting because, first of all, you find out um, that 25 years ago he effectively anticipated much of the um, product centered view, um, uh, sort of gradual incrementalism uh, that is uh, currently encouraged. Many of the ideas of experimentation that we find in things like Lean Startup. Uh, and and uh, a lot of lean thinking in terms of scope, um, all of this stuff that we see now, plus a few other things that are commonly overlooked. So I thought, you know, I want to go back and revisit what he was talking about um, and see examples of that, both in the technologies that we use, but also the products and the style of thinking. So that is uh, that was my motivation. Now, what it is is not what people think it is. Unfortunately, this is the, the weakest thing about worse is better is the name. The name is. It makes you think, because this is how you normally use the words, it makes you think worse means low quality. Yeah. And therefore, naturally, in your mind, you think, okay, if we aim for a low quality product, if we don't worry about the code's uh, quality, its correctness, um, uh, we don't worry about that, and there's a, it's okay to have a few extra features that are kind of only half implemented, let's just throw stuff in, then that's the better path. And he was actually saying the exact opposite. The exact opposite. What he was saying is that the idealized view of product development is that you envision what you want, whether it is a uh, whether it is a framework, whether it is an actual end user product uh, or a large scale system. You envision everything that you want. Completeness is absolutely um, the road to perfection. You make it complete. You make it consistent. Um, you make it simple on the outside, but complexity on the inside doesn't matter, uh, and so on. Uh, and of course, correctness is important, uh, and so on. But these things are intention. It turns out that to do this is, um, although it is exactly that, it is an ideal. It is something that you can yeah. very as, aspirational. As it is aspirational, and it's it's not that it's bad. It's just that we are human. Um, yes. The problem is, it's a mismatch between aspiration and and vehicle, which is us. And he was saying, by worse, what he means is just narrow the scope, just focus on less, make it rather than cover all the situations. Cover the core situation. Start with a really simple, focused thing. Be specific and make sure the implementation, he kept stressing that performance characteristics are essential. Um, when things are fast, people tend not to complain about them. When something is fast, you, you rarely complain, that's just too quick. You know? yeah. um, it is one of the principal uh, and most overlooked aspects of usability. If something is fast, it eliminates, you know, it, it eliminates most of people's complaints. Performance is an issue. Lack of performance is what causes frustration. Um, if it doesn't respond to you as a human at your rate, then this is going to be frustrating. Um, and that's from the external product point of view, but we also see it in the code uh, face. And he emphasizes simple, uh, simple implementation. 
If it's simple, I can understand it. If it's simple, I can add to it. If it's simple, I can throw it away. And the point I made in the keynote is this idea of discardability is very much overlooked. The idea that we tried it, it worked, now we know something better, and it's okay. We, we are throwing away the code, but not the knowledge. We have learned something. Yeah. Um, but normally, we end up with such baroque, monstrous code that we simply fear throwing yeah. it away. I've invested so much effort. This is my baby. This is my baby. You have a genuine attachment to it. Yeah. So it's the endowment effect, is that I build this and therefore it's mine. And the more of it there is, the harder it is to let go. And there is that sense of you know throwing away work, whereas really code is an encoding of knowledge. This yeah. is what we learnt. Um, and that's, that's how we should consider it. So it's like a whiteboard principle. You've got the formula and you can scrub it up and just keep yeah. going. As yeah, and that is, that is very much the vision. So the worst is better. When we look back at it, it tells us that um, we need to apply, um, we need to be engaging more in experimentation with, with our product, trying things out that don't work. We need to really focus on these qualities um, because, the uh, first of all, in terms of the performance, how the thing performs, um, but also in terms of, you know, that's I guess the old phrase is customer delight, you know, there, there, there's that, but also from the development perspective, you don't want, you want to be able to um, uh, sort of turn like a skateboard rather than turn like a, an oil tanker. Yes. Um, you, when somebody, when you change your mind about something, you should not have that degree of attachment or you should be able to mine the code for existing knowledge and I think that's very, very important. So there's a whole load of things there he's saying, and he's not saying, you know, uh, iterations are a user story delivery mechanism and stuff like that. He's, he's saying something very, very different. He's giving us a focus for each step in the development. Yeah. So it's kind of just instead of kind of just taking it literally read between the lines and be sensible. Read between, yeah. There's, there's an idea of use your brain, but the problem is that there's an awful lot of brain, there's an awful lot of uses. So there is a guidance here as to how to think. And the, his point about you know, correctness is very important. It bugs, people don't enjoy bugs. And if it's easier to implement something that is smaller and more focused you will, uh, than something that is larger and has more bugs, then go for the smaller, more focused ones. Bugs are a bind. Um, so yeah, that, that's a very, it's a very streamlined approach. So it reinforces many things, but it also clarifies and knocks a few things out of the way that, that have become, I guess, dogma, if you like. Yeah. I suppose, you know, things build up over two decades, which is... They do, and that's, I, th I felt that was an appropriate kind of time to look back on it. It's just, you know, oh, uh, let's go back to the future, let's actually find out what we were thinking, and, and uh, how is this idea fed? And I guess that also kind of links into um, one of the original writers of the Agile Manifesto, Dave Thomas, recently wrote a diatribe against kind of the modern Agile culture, like all the conferences and things around yeah. it. What's your take on this? Uh, I understand where he's coming from. Um, because really he, he is very much, and uh, something that I often emphasize uh, when I'm describing Agile approaches, is, is that what we're talking about is um, the overlook that Agile has become a noun, it's become almost a, a trademark, yeah. um, rather than referring to it in terms of its original, its original characteristics. And I think that, I just said worse is better is a terrible name. Actually, it turns out Agile is a pretty good name. Um, uh, as a, as a word, it can be abused, and it, it anything funky, become, yeah, if, if things become popular, that's always going to happen. I mean, you can call, call you can use the best name in the universe, and it will still uh, uh, become devalued over time. But with agile, it does have a meaning. It's an adjective. It describes a property of something, and so the this idea of that it is it's a uh, it, it references agility, and that idea is what we should be aiming for. And the problem is that. What has happened uh, in many cases is that people are focusing on the, if you like, the, the, the culture and core ideas of uh, sort of an orthodoxy of Agile. This is not to say that everybody's doing it, but that that has become very, very normal. Rather than, we are after a property. What is that property? The property is that of agility. And, you know, it's difficult to, difficult to say that that is a, a thing that you can organise conferences around and necessarily do other things around. Um, it's it's a it's a direction. Um, it's a set of properties, um, and it and so therefore, it needs to keep moving. There is that idea. So he's not he's not attacking the idea. He's no. not attacking the original principles, um, and he's not attacking much of what has been learned. But what he is attacking is the sort of the idea of almost a an industry and a sedate orthodoxy that everything is yeah. clustered around. You can buy agile. You can buy yeah, yeah. It's it's a thing you plug into your organisation. It's yeah. a commoditization of that level. 
Um, whereas agility is a thing your organisation has or does not. It is not a bolt-on quality. It is a, um, it is a property of how it works, how it flows. Uh, finally, your work quite, one of your most famous works is 97 Rules for uh, Every Programmer Needs to Know. Um, I'm not the title there. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. 97 <laughs> Things Every Programmer Should Know. That's it. Yeah. Um, as a bonus for our readers today, can you add three more to round it up to 100? Sure, you see, I'm reluctant to add it up to, uh, round it up to 100. Um, the original vision of 97 Things, that came from Richard Monson Hayfield, was that it must be, uh, you want 100 things. Uh, you want around 100, but 100 is too obvious, and 99 and 101 are trying too hard not to be 100, so they're a bit obvious about it. Um, and he chose 97, that's a nice prime number. Um, but if we were to add three, right, let's add one. And let's add one, and I'll see if I can think of two more. One, worse is better. I'm going to have to say that one, because uh, 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 I think that is a... That, that has is been a, the theme of today. That Sorry. has been the theme of today, so I'm going to add that as 98. Um, uh, I think 99 is... Um, Find, I'm going to say find your constraints, because one of the other things that I said uh, in the keynote today was from a point of view of creativity and good work, when we look at other disciplines, uh, art, creative writing and so on, one of the things that spurs creativity and spurs good design and good outcomes and so on is having a boundary, defining a constraint. One of the worst things you can do to uh, somebody uh, thinking creatively is, not, is just say, create stuff, that's terrible. You need to give them some kind of constraint against which they can work. Yeah. Uh, and that will provoke your learning. It will, uh, it will also provoke um, sometimes a better product. And uh, I gave an example in terms of how Unix had evolved and that this was a, these constraints were fundamental. Uh, the constraints are always there, but sometimes you need to make them visible and you need to acknowledge them and basically say that these are the constraints. Normally, and I don't mean the usual constraints, which is work within your organisation. Yeah, that's the, I, I mean a little bit more in terms of what it is that you're working with, even if it's just writing a simple function um, uh, or, or working, with, uh, uh, working with a tool or so on. It's this idea of the crea uh, by placing a constraint, artificial or otherwise, or acknowledging something that's there, um, you may find that you learn an awful lot more and can do something better. So we're up to 99. Um, uh, and I guess um, uh, 100 is, um, I guess it's, uh, uh, take some time, just chill out, you know? Because I think that, that, that is the, the, many developers find that they lose the joy of yeah. development. I yeah. mean, the, the happiness is a, you know, this is, this is one of the things. Happy, when you have a bunch of people who are happy and enjoying what they are doing, they can, do, they can do so much. And whenever people start pushing on productivity and metrics for productivity and they start pushing on those, normally they're compensating for a lack of joy. You know? But that, that's the point, is that we are, we are compensating in fact people don't seem to have, so we need to measure them in other ways. And quite frankly, I'm going to software development because I thought it was enjoyable. Yeah. And therefore, I, you know, I think it's, we're not allowed to use terms like happiness and joy as, as a product qual uh, project qualities. And I think we should. Yeah, um, but we need to go into that. as a lot of developers say, the creativity is what drives them. And I guess if you're yeah. kind of putting that time constraint on that, kind of exactly, it, it, it yeah. gives you that joy. That is where that is your reward. And so it's looking for that reward. And there is, and it is that, and it's, it comes in intrinsic motivation. Uh, the thing, and I think that's very important. I don't think we acknowledge that. Well, we acknowledge it occasionally, and then say, "Right, understood," and yeah. move off back Can to the work as if they were uninterested. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for talking to us today. It's really interesting. Cheers.